<laughs> All right. Give me a King's Gambit before we hit the big issue of the top three losing. Well, well the game's changing before our eyes. I love it when that happens. A- and some cl- clubs and some coaching crew uh, are ahead of others. And so on the weekend, and, and it's about it's about – defeating what the opposition are trying to set up. It's a, it's about not allowing them to be their best. And if you want to go head-to-head head with their best, well, good luck. Um, so most of the competition try to to minimise the damage on turnover. Their turnover, how do we minimise the cost? Playing wide, going long down the line, kicking wide inside your own forward 50 to then be able to defend that lost ball. So they, the game's full of errors. So they basically just find ways to minimise the loss once they turn it over. Because more often than not, that's what happens. So intercept markers have become a prime piece in that. Okay, and we've talked a lot about those those types of players. Okay, so there's there's guys like you know Taylor and Andrews and Sisley, all, all these guys, right? So on the weekend there were 328 intercept marks, which is the most for the last 15 rounds of footy. Right, the most. So it's it's a it's an epidemic. It's a problem in our game that. The coaches have to work out. Defenders have never won more one-on-ones than what they are right now. Not not diffusing, not not spoiling, not bringing the ball to ground, actually marking the ball, winning the one-on-one, okay? They've never won a greater percentage of what they're winning right now. So this is, this is something that you either address or you get beaten by. So I think there's a role right now that's become absolutely critical in, in keeping you in the game, and it's the diffuser. It's the guy like a like a, a a shaman yesterday for the for for the Saints says to James Sisley, you're not intercept marking the ball. We we will not be beaten by you again. You got us last time. Not happening today. Okay. So then, then it throws chaos into that defensive fifty for the Hawks, and they don't handle it for a quarter, and they bleed goals from centre bounce because they're not losing. They're not giving the ball back once they've won the centre bounce. It's continuing on, and they score. So scoring from stoppage is not necessarily the actual stoppage. It's the next contest and the contest after that. So if you can ensure that the opposition don't win that ball back, they don't interrupt, you score. So there's some clubs are smarter at this than others. And, and I'll, I'll get to this individual matchup later on. And who you use is the art of coaching. So if, you've got, if, you've, if you're lucky enough to have a Charlie Kerno or a Tex Walker, you probably don't have to worry about it because – Charlie, you're happy with Darcy Moore to go with Charlie, and you're happy with Alir Alir on on Tex because we think Tex can outsmart him at times, and, and we think he's, he's probably more gettable than others. So the Charmin Sisley one I mentioned, and then and then Stephen King uses Ben King, who's horribly out of form for a month of footy, hasn't kicked a goal, doesn't even look like marking the ball. He says, "Hey, no, I'm going to reprogram you. You're now a defender against Harris Andrews." And he says, "Well, okay, so I don't have to think about where I'm running. I've just got to." I've just got to run to where he is. Yep. And I've got to defend him. And then all of a sudden he kicks five goals. And you say, what What an act of brilliance in the coach's box. And, and, a, and a plan that would have been week long to give to, to take away Harris Andrews. We're not going to be beaten by Harris Andrews. And I'll get to the coaching on that game in a moment. But just, just the role of the diffuser. I saw Oscar, Oscar Allen yesterday. He, he was two on one for the whole day. And all he did was throw his body in or pack to bring the ball to ground. And, and he's, he's got not a lot to show for it. He kicks two goals too. And everyone says, oh, there's a solid game. Not a solid game at all. He's giving his body for the cause. And, and I, 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 look at, um, I look at the way a Sam Taylor plays. This is why it's very hard to take Sam Taylor's game away because he stands next to the best and then he just cold beats him. So to tag him is impossible because he's going to go to Aaron Norton. And he's going to stand Aaron Norton and when the ball comes in, He's going to body and he's going to try and outmark. Now, you can put a tag at a Sam Taylor, but you're going to end up two on one and free up a defender. So this is the strategy behind who your diffuser is and how you deny the opposition intercept marking prime mover is going to dictate what happens in a final series. So if you haven't got one, you want to get one in a hurry. And maybe, you know what, maybe it's too late. Find the guy who can cut the blue wire. Not the red wire, the Not blue the wire, wire. The diffuser. <laughs> the King's Gambit. All right. The, the big issue, so the top three lost. Mm. You can have a late season scrape. But who came out of it with warts? With warts. Yeah. Who, who's warts? Collingwood, Brisbane, Port Adelaide. Were there any warts there? Well, I think, see, my theory is there's a, you can still have positives in, in, in a loss. 
And, and I look at Collingwood, and they probably got beaten the same way they've been beaten the last few weeks. They got out hunted at ground level. So there's an issue there. there, there there's, there's clearly a problem there. And their, their key back got beaten again, Darcy Moore. Fant- terrific in terms of trying to intercept and do all that sort of stuff. And you know, he and Murphy have, be, have been really good. But there's, there's a problem there because they're getting beaten every now and then by the by the, the key forward of the prime key forward for the opposition. So I, there's there's a there's a problem there at selection. I think they need to bring Frampton back in and look like they did at the start of the year, where Moore and Murphy could play their own role a bit, get a little bit wrong. When you get a little bit wrong on a third stringer, you don't always pay the price. When you get it wrong on Charlie Kerno, go on, done, over, goal. Um, so that that's the subtle shift for me. Um, if they bring him in. That we saw Howe go forward. I thought Howe was terrific in that last quarter, kicked three goals, but it was more the way he moves. The way he moves is like is like a forward moves. They're ahead of time. They see what's happening a split second before the defenders do, and that's where they create separation. And if you can't create separation, you can't play forward. It's as simple as that. So he's a better option than a Mason Cox. He's a better option than, than, than a Frampton forward. So I think that they will look at that. So I don't think there is many warts. Okay, got a ground ball issue. I think that can correct. Not a problem. Um, you look at Port Adelaide. I think Port Adelaide becomes Scotty Muller. They can't defend. They can't attack. They can't win the ball. That, that's a, that's a bad phase to be in. A really bad phase. So if you look at the, if you look at the numbers that we Horny and I track, and you can believe these or not, you, you choose choose your own adventure. Um, so over the last six weeks, that's a big enough sample size, six weeks. So there's some wins in there as well, three and three over the last six weeks. They're bottom four in the comp with the footy. They're bottom six in the comp without the footy. And there's some real problems yeah, in terms of being able to stop the opposition scoring when they go inside 50. And I've been talking about that all year and nothing's changed there. So they haven't explored anything there and nothing's changed. And that's going to roll on now into a final series. And now they're bottom six for clearance differential from scoring, scoring from clearance differential, that's an issue. And they're also bottom four for winning contest out in general play. So there's not a lot of assets. They're asset poor at the absolute prime time of the year. So they, what do they got? They got three weeks to tinker. Are we really going to tinker in rounds 20 to 20, you know, 21 to 24? It's a bad time to be tinkering, but there's, there's major change needed if they're not to go out in straight sets. Um, so that, that's a problem for me. People say, oh, you're hard on Ken, you're hard on Port. This is a reality of, of what's happening. Brisbane, I think Brisbane simply got outcoached in, in every facet. And that's, I'm not going to Chris Fagan, I'm going to the group. There's, there's a collective there that have set this game up. And I think they're on autopilot a little bit. This is what we do. Out we go, boys. And they, they probably weren't ready for the coaching performance of the year from Stephen King. I, I, I a guy that's only coached that had his hands on the wheel for three weeks to be able to do what he did. Can we step through what he did? Two. He sent took Miller to, to Lockie Neal, and Bowl reports took put his hand up for that. So that, that's an easy one. Okay. So that that's not really. There's nothing revolutionary about that. He said to no. He, he orchestrated Noah Anderson to spin his role. So sometimes be half forward, sometimes be wing, sometimes be on ball, just mix it up. And when you get to stoppages, let's create some confusion. So no one really knows who's who's marking you. And you go to that awkward spot that's eight to 10 metres off the stoppage and they'll be thinking, who's got this guy? And before they're organised, we'll be having shots at goal. Before they're organised in general play, no one will know who's, who's responsible for you. And they're not overly defensively geared, the, the Brisbane midfield. Let's be, let's be frank about that. Yep. They give you some space. And he's kicking become a feature in this game. He worked Ben King in, in, into marks that he would never have taken with anyone else kicking the ball in. He said, "There, I'm going to kick the ball there and you're going to jog into that and mark it in front of your eyes. It was terrific coaching. And then he, he, he orchestrated Ben King to tag Harris Andrews. Now, Harris Andrews doesn't want to play fullback and he doesn't want to play man. And they've had him as that high, high center half back intercepting between the arcs. But because Payne didn't know what to do and Harris didn't know how to handle it, they wandered around aimlessly for 60, 65 minutes and the game was done. And all of a sudden, Ben King's kicking five goals. He hasn't looked like getting five touches for about six weeks. So it was, it was the coaching performance of the year that to me said, you know what, I wouldn't be racing to sign any coach if this is the next wave of coaches coming through. King, 
McQualter, we're seeing Kingsley, what he's doing at the moment. We're seeing what McRae's doing at the moment. This next wave of coaching has gone up a gear. So we've always reverted back to what we know, the, old, the older guys, the older brigade. They've got the stripes on the, on the shoulders. But Stephen King said to me, hey, don't, don't, if you haven't already made your decision up here, just, just hold. And they may have already done that. And we all think they have. But if they haven't, just hold fire. Let's go straight to preliminary final integrity because this goes to Melbourne. We posed the open question around Melbourne for 18 months. What's it going to look like when it really matters? Simon Goodwin, three weeks ago, goes, I'm leaving no stone unturned. And he has yesterday presented the most compelling Melbourne forward line that we've seen since they won a flag. Does Melbourne's forward setup now have PFI? So, so let's just look at what the evidence that we, that we that's right in front of us. So... So prior to so Fritz goes down in round sixteen, okay. So I'm not talking about that game specifically because that's an in-game issue. So around seventeen to twenty, which is which is a small sample, but it's what we've got to look at, right? Since they've been impacted forward of centre, what what has he done to, to to shift the course of things? So prior to prior to round seventeen, Melbourne were tenth rated in the competition at turning an entry into a goal, tenth rated, which is which is okay. But if when you get to September, the OKs get you beaten. Okay is no good in September. You've got to be top four, top six. You know, have, an, have that, something as a point of difference that has to be absolutely number one. So that, that's miles from that. So since round 17, their forward 50 is second best at turning an entry into a goal. 28%. Now, that is a massive shift. That means you don't have to have 60 inside 50s to win. You can win with 45. So that, that doesn't stress the rest of your game. So it's about it's about – holding assets and then growing other assets. So that that's huge growth. So I, I guess what it does do, it makes me think, okay, so what 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 changed? What's changed? What did it look like on the weekends? On the weekend, their forward 50 entries, 10 of them went to Petty. He was targeted 10 times. Now, most people would say, gee, that sounds like a lot to go to a player like that. Seven marks inside 56 goals. Melksham, this is why I, I really like Melksham as, as yep. the, the package that he brings. Six times targeted, couple of marks, but never outmarked. Like they just compete. So I think that's why Simon Goodwin loves them so much because they know they're probably not the best player out there. They know that in terms of where the pecking order of this team, they're not in the they're not in the first ten names discussed, but they're becoming critical members to make sure that you can maintain that one in every three, one in every three and a half entries for a goal, and that's that's an asset that they need to keep. So Petrarca, we've talked about a lot. He's had a fair impact in that that four week block or the six week block as a forward. He was required more in the midfield on the weekend because of Richmond's clearance, um, the, the way they can control clearance this season. So he was a diff- He's not really the talking point for this week. So I guess the discussion goes to when Fritz comes back and even when Oliver comes back into that midfield. Do you still continue with the sum of all parts type mentality? Or do you then say, no, we're just going to give the responsibility back to the stars? And I think this is a, this is a dangerous a dangerous time when they're coming back in. So Fritch can come back in, but do you, you can't start just kicking the ball to Fritch when you're getting the returns from Petty and, and the sum of all parts. So I, I wonder what the use of Oliver will be, and I wonder what the use of Fritch will be. Because he's, he's an out-of-the-goal square type operator um, that, that commands most of their targets but you don't necessarily get the returns that you're getting at the moment. So this is – it's a great problem to have. Fancy having the magnet of Clayton Oliver to work with. I think they should look at maybe a, you know, a 60-40 split. You know, their midfield's really functioning quite well. What they kicked? They kicked 20 goals yesterday. It's a big number. Mm. It's a big number. And I know they've, they've leaked a little bit more than what they normally do, but – This is part of the tweak though, isn't it? Yeah. Is that they are prepared to be scored against a little bit more – to get a bit more out of their offense. But don't be confused, right? And don't don't get seduced by all this other stuff, all these other numbers and and and, and what's changed. The absolute reality is that it was 92 points to 98. And Max Gorn took total control for 10 minutes. Yep. So the, the the you know it was Mad Max. He got poked in the eye and then he became Mad Max for 10 minutes. He had seven clearances of the next 11. Seven of the next 11 by himself. He just become this brute 
just moving Solder out of the way, grabbing the ball, driving it in. He'd become a tackler. He'd become an intercept marker. He'd roll back like we know he can, pick one off at centre-half back. That, that, that package that is Max Gorn is unstoppable. There isn't a player in the competition that can stop Max doing that. It's an advantage that no one has. So of, of all the teams still left, they would all be thinking, what the hell do we do about Max? How do we stop Max? So this, so still they've got the greatest wild card in the comp. And that's why they are mounting this charge. And that's why everyone's now looking at the ladder going, gee, what happens if they finish second? Mm. I can get them to second without too much trouble. <laughs> you can get anyone anyway. This is your seedings <laughs> you again. Go, if you just reverse <laughs> engineer. <laughs> well, it looks like they, they, given their draw and their run home compared to those around them, particularly Port and Brisbane, they probably will finish second. Home final MCG, home final prelim against likely interstate teams travelling. Gee whiz, it does open up. But it's all because of that man, Max. He's become the dominant player in the competition again. And, and, and there's very few, there's very few that have the answers. So Melbourne have moved from a bit of an iffy proposition to PFI stamped all over them, I think. And they've done it through great coaching. The good coaches see the problem and get to work solving the problem. And they don't challenge. stick their head in the sand. The, the, the challenge is the important part. So, so Max, I'm, I'm dropping Brody Grundy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you understand what this is going to do? Do you understand now that we are saying you have to be the man and we are going to cop enormous feedback? If this doesn't work, can you imagine the feedback? We've gone and got this guy, big deal. He's our point of difference. He's now, he's now playing at Casey. We, we can't meander now. Take over this footy club and be the man you've been for the last six, seven years and get us the opportunity to endorse this group, this list, this, this time period with another premiership. Come and be the man. So I, I think he's responded. Petrarca's responded. I can't wait to see Oliver back in to see how he, how he goes. Um, it, it's, it's awesome. I, I love seeing teams correct like this uh, uh, post-challenge. So from PFI to the pressure index, the Western Bulldogs, this is a bit of an encapsulation of who they are. They get into really good positions. So I ran through a list of the Giants have won six games from behind. They're actually more impressive than Collingwood in what they've been doing. The Dogs have lost their games from three goals up, three goals up, six goals up, four goals up, two goals up, three goals up. Sydney, Suns, Giants, Pies, Port, Cats. It's... 35 points up early in the third quarter. Two key defenders go down. Not much changes in your structure, and they get overrun. This is part of their equation, and they are less than they expect to be, never mind us on the outside. They are less than they expect to be, and they're still in this tooth and nail struggle to make the eight, let alone grow into the team that's challenging the top four that they so badly want to be. Yeah, well, can we just start by saying I think Luke Beveridge is, is a different coach and there's, there's a place in our game for difference. And when it's working, it's, you're called eccentric and when it's failing, you're called fool. There's no grey area with different. So I think he's a terrific motivator. I think he's a great storyteller. He's a, he's a, he's a, ripper. He's a ripper in terms of getting the best out of, of, of those around him. But on game day, I just, I've got concerns. I watched that game meander for the last 45 minutes with Norton being beaten by Taylor when the problem is clearly down back. They are coming. They are charging. There's space everywhere in the in the Giants' four line. I, I, I watched Sam Mitchell. Anytime Hawthorne get in trouble, and they're at a, they're at a different end, they're not, they're not looking to save games, yet they're looking to save games. So he puts Will Day behind the ball and says, hey, mate, you go and be the man. Part of his development, I get that, right? But really, they want to win the game. Against Richmond last week, they wanted to win that game. They worked so hard to get themselves in a position to win that game. He wanted to make sure it happened. Why, is it, why, why does Aaron Norton ever go down back as the loose man? Not, not, as, not as even a centre-half back or a full-back. Given the fact you'd lost Keith and you'd lost Bruce, there was an opportunity to, to have a look at it. And you could mount a case, I don't want to do this, but we had to because of circumstance. He died on the vine, for us. And, and the, the answer coming from the dogs is easy. They'll say, well, we had to have him compete with Taylor because if we didn't have that, Taylor would have taken control of the game. Well, he took control of the game anyway. So you don't, you've got to explore. 
So why wouldn't they use him as a plus one? And then maybe you don't get Toby Green walking to those goals. Maybe then you don't get Riccardi. You know, you and I chatted about that earlier. You don't, maybe don't get that influence from a Riccardi. Yeah. So Toby Green can beat you because he's a great. But shut Riccardi out. But not unassisted. He can't. He, he can. He can. He can beat you one on one if you allow it. I'm not taking that risk. I, I think there's enough evidence to see that Toby Green's probably the best player in the comp right now, up there with Dacos and Petrarca and Bontempelli. Right. I think he's Australian captain. We had this discussion yeah, yeah. last Wednesday Come to night. That yep. So, so why would you allow one player in Taylor Jure to get it right or get it wrong on the best player in the comp when you're six goals in front? And then five goals in front, and then four goals in front, and then three goals. Someone in the box has to be saying, "Hey, hey, coach, we're we, we doing the right thing here. Do we need to put some assistance around Taylor Jure?" And the, then the last goal, the tap, the tap to Toby. He's on no one. He's by himself. As a young, he stood the mark because that's what Toby does. He's so smart. He stands the mark because the player who's his opponent has to go and become an option. An option. So they run to the. They effectively separate off Toby. He takes the mark all the time, and as soon as the ball's kicked, he charges back to goal side. And the guy who's kicked it's watching the ball to see how that's gone. All of a sudden, he's goal side of him, and that's why he's so good. He beats you before the ball gets there. I don't know how many times I can show the same vision of if you let him get one step goal side, it's over. It's over. Wave the checkered flag. So they got beaten the same way for 40 minutes of footy. And th that's on Luke Beveridge. Now, post-game, I'd love him to say, you know what, I've made some mistakes today. Not, not go through, the, oh, you know, this, that, and this, that, and the other. No. This, this is in the box, this one. What did they change? You were there. You you you, you watched the game. No, stun they, they were paralysed by it. And they were finishing. Their, their last quarter was inexcusable. They were finishing with the wind. Mm. It, it was a momentum turned against them in the third quarter. That was okay. And the, the Giants got full tote odds out of it. But to not balance up in the last quarter and the, how horribly lopsided the, the ball winning was, the run... Like some, it was inevitable that they were going to hit the front unless you did something to alter the state of it. I understand at the start of the last quarter going, okay, let's just get back to dominating the way we had. Once yeah. that wasn't happening, that they stood still and got beaten. So so this is the game's about challenge, right? And no one's immune. So in that period we're talking about, that 40 minutes where the 36-point the, the lead just was withered away, he had, at some stage someone had to ch challenge Marcus Bontempelli to be the man. And he's had a terrific year, right? But you, you had the discussion on crunch time with uh, with Wittering. Yep. This is what we're talking about: is challenging everyone. It's they're not immune because they're your best player and they're having a good year. You're going to challenge them. So he had seven touches in that in that period. No, mate, we need you to have fifteen touches. We need you to roll behind the footy for a bit. Can you can you be the reason we stay afloat here? So I think it's a heavy review out there. You can't be beaten in the coach's box the same way consistently through one season. And I, I think that there's a harsh review coming in. I, I, I know I don't know Bevo well, but I know him well enough to know that he would stand at the front of the group and say, oh, I got some things wrong, Scott. I, I made some mistakes. It's a bad day. So the best bit was Toby Green and the way that he was able to turn that game. So you presented on Wednesday night and made the powerful case to be all Australian captain with that legacy piece. Mm. It doesn't even need that anymore is his capacity to alter his team's fate in game through his acts and his leadership. He's the best player in the comp. Uh, he's the best. No, sorry. He's the best captain in the comp. Yeah. A and I I've got, there are the six games that they've won. Some of those from impossible positions. Um, Oh, what an inspiring figure he is. So I'm watching that game and I'm thinking, okay, we're going to work out who the all Australian Ruckman really is this year, Briggs versus English, <laughs> and, and with Gorn not playing that game. So let's let's work out. So it's a fascinating watch. And I'm probably going to work out who the all Australian captain is, Bontempelli versus Green. One was the difference. One still played a pretty good game of footy, um, but, but not really. You know, when the whips were cracking. Hey, who's worth more on the open market right now? Forget, forget, forget uh, positions. Toby Green or Sam Taylor? <laughs> That's such uh, Toby Green. I, I think Sam Taylor, the way he plays, so you can't you can't take it off him. He'll stand the best player, yeah. and then he'll just cold beat him. He 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 is ruining games. <laughs> I, I I think he's 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 an outstanding. He's, you know what? He's a bit like Glenn Archer, in that you don't want to hear from them. 
you don't want to, you don't want to talk to them because they're too nice. They're, they're good people. They're too nice. I don't want to say Sam Taylor should just have this 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 mystique about him <laughs> that he's a killer. Yeah. <laughs> don't 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 talk to us and show how, how good a bloke you are and how nice you are. Don't do any interviews. Just let everyone think the killer's coming to town. You know. Yeah. Just a little nod to an old friend of the program, Craig Jennings, Jenna. who runs the defence at the Giants, and so much of this owes no, to No, he's what- not doing defence. He's doing uh, – he's he's actually doing some offensive work this year. His role slightly shifted. Yeah. I'm trying to think who is doing the backs. I had a discussion a couple of weeks ago with the Giants. Yeah. No, he's having a great year. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're having a great year, aren't they? They are. In the coach's box. Yeah. Yeah. King, Kudos King, to them. Kingsley looks relaxed now. <laughs> he's sorted out how to deal with game day. Yeah. It's, oh, look, they're a great story. It, someone's just texting Kingsley for coach of the year. I mean, you could mount a case for that. He's, he, well, they won seven in, seven a in a row. Seven in a row. They're still going to have to make the finals to fully make that case, I yeah, think. But yeah. uh, it's Who would be coach of the year right now? Uh, I, I think it's still in the wind. Yeah. I think it's still in the wind, some of the, the jobs that have when been When you're done. interviewing coaches on Saturdays, in your crunch time, can you ask them who they would vote coach would of the year? Yeah, they'll be voting shortly. Yeah. They got that right. Carlton, and there are so many levels to this. I spoke with Brian Cook on Friday night, and he outlined you want a supportive environment but an accountable environment, and then we workshop both of those two layers. He said that there was almost an air of gratitude from the players when they stood behind the coach because the history of Carlton is to tear things down when you hit that stretch, and we were hearing it every Monday morning. So, A, staring that down, but then B, the level of coaching that's gone into, this hasn't happened by accident, and this just hasn't suddenly turned. The layers that have gone into making this turn, and it's everything from the conversations that were being had. If you didn't hear Jacob Wittering with us on Crunch Time, just take the time to listen to the podcast. I'm going to revisit it with Bucks tomorrow, and then what they've done within their game, and now they're on a six-game winning streak. They're inside the finals and they performed like that against Collingwood. They got so much right for Loop Logics, the Swiss Army knife of construction management. Now, yeah, so I've been big on Carlton for 12 to 18 months, and then when they fail, when they when they challenge the numbers, we put it on the radar. You and I sat here and we said, Weedering needs to be more for this team. He just can't be a solid defender. Cripps needs to get violent again at, at clearances. Walsh needs to become first receive off stoppage and start to run and gun like he did last year. Vossi read the riot act to these leaders. And I don't I don't subscribe to all that stuff. You, you, I reckon they made a mess of supporting the coach. An absolute mess. Of, remember, remember we talked about it? They did early. It made a mess of it. much better in the middle. A total meal of it. So to rewrite history is a little bit clever. I think this has just come down to guys accepting that they, they need to be more if they're going to be successful. So let the, the story is weedering. And without that, if your big blokes don't play big, you can't go anywhere. And you know, we spent all week talking about Max Gorn. They needed weedering to become a Darcy Moore or a Harris Andrews, not just a, not just a good defender. The, the Giants are running the gauntlet because of Sam Taylor. Green's doing it at the other end, but they, they you can't score against the Giants. So all strategy now goes into Sam Taylor. All strategy now has to go into Jacob Wittering. So this is the gap. So let's just look at the last six weeks of footy. So since round 15, defensive one-on-one. So I'm big on this, okay? So stuck in one-on-ones. He's been in 14 one-on-ones, uh, Wittering. He's won 10 of them. He's cold one 10 of 14. He hasn't lost any of them. He's... He's the best defender in the comp on numbers in terms of um, the last five or six weeks. Sam Taylor's best across a larger period than that and is involved in more of them. So he's, he's, he's less protected than Wiedering. Um, but what Jacob's been able to do is become a different player. He's now, been, he's now a disruptor, not just a, not just a negator. So you, you can play all sorts of uh, football with this guy now. He can play on anyone. He can play on their best. He can play on their second stringer, or their, he he can just roll and change. Um, so it's a different product. But Patrick Cripps, just have a look at Patrick Cripps at clearance. Now I know we often take the negative, right? And we're looking at the Dacos um, co- you know, com- confrontation with with Newman and, and and Patrick breaking two or three tackles, and they go, "Oh, how bad are those tackles?" Don't worry about the tackles. 
How violent is Cripps to get himself out of those positions? So surrounded by four for that six-week block where they were timid, he would just dump kick the ball or, or just handball it off and hope that something would happen. Not now. He would he would he would now tries to engage in the tackler. Come on, see if he can get me. Come in, come into step into my wheelhouse. And and then he will break and, and rip and tear and create an exit for the first receive. And then they're gone. That's the difference now. That's why they look so aggressive from stoppage, because they're prepared to engage in in the brutality of six V six or even six V eight. Because now you have to have an extra midfielder there. Because these guys are coming out of the front again. And they got they got they were there was every reason why they should have got rolled on the weekend. When Chera went down just just before I felt like it was just before half time, but he played in the third quarter at the start. He played, I think, the first five minutes, but he, yeah. I thought they're in trouble here. Yeah, this guy's been in great form for so long, you know, and they're without this bloke and they're without this bloke. I get all of that, right? But it wasn't about who wasn't there, it was about who, how the guys that were there were yeah. playing. And for a lot of time, Carlton were hostage to who was there and who wasn't there. There's a whole lot of things that they've rectified, I so, reckon. So it's not the who, it's the how. Yeah. how not not the, that it's Walsh or that it's Chera or that it's this. It's, and then all of a sudden, Kerno says, well, Harry's not here. It has to be me. And then Motlop says, well, I know where it's going. It's going there. And then all your bit players play bit roles, but they play them 10 out of 10. When you've got confusion, it's impossible for the role player to perform to 10 out of 10. And their 10 out of 10 doesn't necessarily impact the game a lot, but it doesn't hurt you. Mm. So full credit to Michael Voss for having the tough conversation at a time where everyone's wobbly on the coach. So there's a risk in that, isn't there? It was risking sitting down to your leaders and saying, "Hey, I need more, more from you," and they're saying, "Well, hang on, we need, we need more from you too, Fossey." You know, you've just we've just lost five in a row, six in a row, whatever it is, you know. So there's a risk in doing that, but there's clearly there's a buy-in and a level of trust from coach to player to senior player, which which will take them a long way in the future when the same discussions come when you're at the very pointy end in the top three or four. Can you just give us a little layer of um, so last night? Dermot Burton was so good on crunch time on Saturday. He brought hubris, Collingwood yeah. hubris, and went, bop, bop, bop. Loved it. This is where it is. And last night, you did selfish with Nick Dacos, which is rippling through the text. I think that's fair to say. Yeah, and, and I don't think he's a selfish player, but I think that the years, he's noticed, he's knowing the impact that he's having on games now, right? So he's, he's trying to find, the, where, where's the ceiling on this? But there were two instances late in the game on Friday where he said, I'm going to be the goal kicker and I don't really care that I should give it to a teammate in a better position. That's the best way to dry up people giving you back the ball when you're in yeah. the right position yeah. of all time. So don't be that guy. Now, I said you've got to make a decision. Do you want to win a Brownlow or do you want to win a premiership? People say, oh, you're too hard on him. I want him to win the Brownlow, Jared. I'm on a 50s. I need him to win the Brownlow, right? <laughs> so let's just put that on the table. Okay. So this is counterintuitive what I'm doing here. Right, I want him to be the goal kicker, but there are times in games where you've got to reward your teammates for the same run that they've done or the same presentation to the footy that you that you will do in a matter of you know quarters time. So ensure the team score, not necessarily that you score, and the rewards rewards will come your way. So I, I was critical of that. Now I think that'll be addressed by Craig McRae. He don't he won't miss that. Hey mate, we got four blokes free here. We'd love Jordan to go to get that goal, who's not exactly setting the world alight at the moment. We'd love him to get reward for getting to the right spot. So that, that'll that be stamped very quickly, Jared. Um, and I'd be surprised if it's not. But I did hear your Dermot discussion was was very good, very accurate. So the the head clash from the showdown on Saturday night, we're sort of in the midst of it right now, is the AFL is doing its investigation. We will need answers publicly to help us understand what happened. And there's a really important delineation in in definition. The HIA, which is the quick assessment down on the bench, and then the SCAT test, which is the 20 minute down in the rooms. And the HIA determines whether you then enter the SCAT. And then concussions are either empirically diagnosed or not diagnosed. I think all of us watching on the couch felt a level of discomfort in how Saturday night unfolded, given what we've been trained to look for. And there's sort of almost that pleading of understanding. You've got to understand what the modern world represents with concussion. And this didn't feel like it fulfilled that. How did you feel about it all? 
Well, I think we've quickly um, changed the HIA to a, a, a visual, a, a short space test now. That, that, that wasn't our understanding at the start of the year. No, as I, re- to where no, we are I remember now. where Laura Kane came into Fox and she actually did delineate between the two. It's just that hadn't been the language that had been used. It had never been the language. Yeah, no. I guess that's my point. So I think coming so we've been into educated. the season, we, we had been told what the two different layers were and they weren't how we'd phrased it previously. Yeah. So I think the definitions are critical in any discussion here. Yeah. And I, oh, I feel that's been a shift. Um, you can you can use whatever language you like, but I feel that's been a shift since the incident. It wasn't mentioned prior to that for me. I'm uncomfortable seeing a player – and we're talking about Lear for a moment, go to ground like that with his arms tensing and, and the jolting action when he hits the ground not being fully scat tested, 20 minutes on the bench, the full invest, uh, investment in his health for 20 minutes. I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable with, with a, with a conversation. I'm not stepping into medical areas. I'm just uncomfortable as a parent if that's my, my my son or my daughter in that position playing a sport to win one given game we're getting back on the field when it's 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 a lifetime post that moment that we've got to, we've got to take into consideration i'm uncomfortable with him being back on the ground 6 minutes later without being te- scat tested um, that's just me i've been in this, this this side of the discussion for 5 years and and i, I think that if it's the same club again, Jared, it's it's happened a couple of times at Port Adelaide. Like, is there something in that? I don't know if there's something in that or not. But the whole thing, it's not just visual. It's it's the it's the, you know, I don't think though. Do you think those players will play this weekend? I don't know. So the way it's been presented to us is concussion is now empirical. You are either arc cussed. Or you're not concussed. You can have delayed concussion, though. For, from a football perspective. So a delayed concussion, yes. But you either end up with concussion or not with concussion. Not at the immediate time, though. You can have delayed concussion. You can. There have been instances of that. But that's you can't forecast whether there's going to be concussion or not. No. What the there, system there asks you to do is go, is there concussion or is there not concussion? And that determines actually whether they play next week as the starting point. Yeah. So, so on that, you would say one's a migraine, we've been told? Yeah. Which is asking... Us to accept a lot. Yeah, meaning. I was just that 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 felt convenient at the time. So you you've got you've got some doubts. If he's out of the game, um, yeah. I so a migraine from a clash of heads. It's not it's not really how we understand it. I don't think as a layman. So I'm not. I don't want to say no, against no, the medical. I'm not That's not catch really you. how we understand that. And I would have thought an independent observer would have wanted a scat test done on Aaliyah just to confirm that there was no concussion. What, so, yeah. So this is, this. they had this situation last year and the, the thresholds changed, but they had the exact situation last year. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable with that. And I, I think I the think league it, should be uncomfortable with that. Yeah. So what, I, I'm not here for penalties necessarily or sanctions and all that sort of stuff, but if we are taking this whole thing about head trauma seriously, then there needs to be a greater protection for the player than just to have him back on the ground. Jared, I've, I've seen players caught off the ground for longer than six minutes in a rotation. This guy had to be assessed for head trauma and he was back on the ground in six minutes. Yeah, yeah. That, that's not right. So I think other clubs, just looking at the vision – they would have expected that Aaliyah would go through the scat test. They put players through the scat test for less than that. That yeah. much I'm confident in saying as a fact. So I think that will be the shift that comes from this. Yeah. And yeah. I think long term, long term, the penalty for failing to meet these criteria should start at $100,000. It should be a six figure fine that sits over it. So just in case you think there's any gray area here, it's a hundred thousand dollar fine if you don't fulfil your obligations I'm, under. I'm head not trauma. finance. Finance does nothing on premiership points or draft picks. That's where I start. If you want to take eight premiership points off a team for getting this wrong, they will not make this mistake, Jared. Yep. Or if you want to take a first round draft pick off a team for getting this wrong, they will not. The coach will override the medical department. Hey, hey, we can't make this mistake. He's out. What? I just don't understand why. 
why this given game is so important to win as opposed to the head trauma of one of your members, one well, the guy that you're there to support and look after. Why is that, why does that override? We've got to be better than that. Yeah. So we need a full understanding in the aftermath of what happened. I think the AFL is obliged not only to figure it out, but then to communicate it what, to all of what us. What will happen? What will be the sanction? I, I don't know. Will there be a sanction? Uh, no, I don't know. I'm not, I wouldn't even begin to guess. I feel like you're holding out of me here. No, I just think we need more information than we currently have. You, well, you don't believe the migraine, but you don't think there'll be a sanction? Uh, no, because there ha- would have to be concussion. And I'm not saying for a moment that there is. In the way that we have prescribed it, there either is or there isn't. Now, I don't know whether that's medically sound either, but for no. the provisions of football, that's what we've decided on. Uh, uh, there, so there's no concussion, but I will be staggered if both of those gentlemen play this weekend. Okay. So we wait and watch, and in a way, that's what the AFL is doing as well. Can I share this email with you? Yeah. I hadn't even thought of this. I got home. This is 12.09 a.m. Saturday. Oh, I love it already. It's midnight Friday. This um, Blues stuff, household is from all me, is buzzing, it? and all I can think about is what Waitley better not wreck this for us. Is that Waitley better not wreck this for us? <laughs> There's a well-known Kenneth curse and the lesser-known Waitley's woes. <laughs> It sets in whenever a certain G. Waitley includes Carlton in his top four seedings. Oh. We will have none of that, Waitley. None of it. <laughs> Keep us out of your seedings until grand final day or I'll spew up Dave from West Footscray. I hadn't even thought of it. And yet, as the weekend has gone on, it's like Inception. It's an idea that I can't shake. The Bambino curse. Whenever you've said, go and win your five, yeah, and then, and then stack back. your 20 points and come back to me, there's been trauma. There has, and I feel like I've missed them. Like Carlton's a on a six-game streak and the Giants are on a seven-game streak. Two opportunities there. Well, this is a year of growth. It's a year of growth for you and exploration, and hopefully next year yeah. you're better for the experience. So I'm going to overreact in my seedings today. Oh, I, like, like, I like when you say this. So I'm going to – I've got two play-back-in games. That's cheating. Right. So just give us your seedings. Don't give us your reasons so why. So Port Adelaide and Brisbane can sit this week and play themselves back hang, hang in. On, hang on a minute. Yep. They're both out. They're both out. They can play themselves back in next week. <laughs> and I'll make the straight adjustment. If they win, straight back in. No questions asked. Four, Carlton. Six in a row. Oh, playing the footy that we imagined that they would, but it's much more sustainable than ever before. You're getting an email again. I am. Hello, Dave. <laughs> Four? Four GWS. And I'm looking forward to when GWS play Carlton in the last game of the year for all the chocolates. Uh, I just think that no team wants to play the Giants at the moment. They're, they're playing brutal football. You can't moot, you can't score against them, and they got the 182 centimeter wild card in the forward half. Three Giants, seven in a row. Toby Green doing amazing things. Oh, Sam God. Taylor, God. you told me on Wednesday night. I try to be educated as we go, as this is the team that can do damage from outside. Seven in a row is hard to argue with. Right now. They are in the best four teams in the footy that they're playing right now. I don't know how you did it, but you managed to bring me into your third seed. Three. <laughs> Brisbane for me. I'm not I'm not dropping right off. Schooled in the coach's box. Um, got a lot of work to do. Maybe, just maybe, the Ashcroft loss is bigger than we think. He could win the Rising Star while being absent because we realise what was missing. Two. Yeah, a better way of wording it than me. Two. Melbourne. Yep. Have Same. sorted out some of their issues. Kudos to them. Unlucky not to be one. Yeah. Challenging one. If I didn't have so much money on Collingwood, Jared, <laughs> they'd be one. One Collingwood. Yes. Come on, Craig. Get them back on track. That, that's the win that you can, that's the loss that you can use to great effect.